I'm not going to talk about sustainable healthy diets because I'm sure Pete and Jenny are going to do that and they're going to do it much more, uh, much better than I am. So Tim's talked about the problem and um, I suspect Pete and Jenny might talk about some of the solutions. I'm going to talk about disagreements because I think that's what the problem is. Um, we all know that food is a problem um, and it's associated with a whole range of different sorts of potential disaster, from the environmental side of things that Tim's been talking about to the health side of things that you will all be extremely familiar with. But it also raises all these issues about what sort of food system we want, what we should do about animal welfare, the whole cultural, social, um, and, and other aspects of food that are so important and that perhaps don't receive quite as much attention. So it's a convergence issue, and we all know that there's a problem. I, I, you know, you can't move for the conferences, for the peer-reviewed journal papers, for the hard-hitting reports, for, the, for this and for that, that. The food system is in crisis, we have twin problems, wicked problems, perfect storms, etc. Yes, we agree that it needs to change. But the problem is that I think we don't have agreement as to what really underpins the problem and therefore what a solution might look like. We have, and that leads to very different answers about what good looks like and specifically what the role of livestock is in a sustainable food system. I'm going to have a look at that. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. So first of all, like who are, who's the we? Well, of course, all 7 billion of us, but because we all eat. But there are particular stakeholders that have a particular interest in the issues, and that ranges from the food industry through to the NGOs, environment, health, animal welfare, people who espouse particular dietary uh, ways forward, the vegans, the vegetarians, you've got your vets, you've got your animal welfare people, and of course you've got the international development community. And you've got these apparently impartial, unbiased, uh, dispassionate uh, policy makers and academics who of course aren't. Um, so how do they define the problem? I mean, I think if you look at all these papers and all these reports and all this advocacy, you get three sorts of problems that emerge, giving rise to three sorts of solution. So you'd say the mainstream one is that we don't have enough food, and of course we're, we're producing food in an environmentally damaging way. So the solution is, of course, to produce this more food, but to do it more efficiently. Another way is to say, well, actually, no, the problem is we're all overweight. We've got 2 billion overweight people. We need to address consumption. And then another way of looking at it is saying the problem is inequity. It's not producers, it's not consumers, it's imbalances in the system. And these analyses of the problem give rise to and are underpinned by very different approaches to what we mean by food security and nutrition, what we mean by good consumption, and even our notions of things like freedom. So if you take, if you take the kind of not enough food uh, approach, it's a focus that producers who need to produce more, using um, more food with less impact, so sustainable intensification, nitrogen use efficiencies, all these things that are absolutely essential. And the focus in terms of the food security is that the concept of these hungry people there's recognition that, you know, we, we also have all these fat people, so the argument is we need to reformulate, we need to breed healthier foods, we need to buy a fortified supplement, and so on and so forth. And it's all about consuming smarter, it's about green growth, and it's the freedom to choose to go into a supermarket and say, I'm going to choose the healthier, lower impact option, it's my choice. Um, and of course, life cycle analysis, relative improvements in efficiency is what drives it. Another way of looking at it is to say, actually, the problem is we're all too fat, we're all too greedy. We need to, the root cause is us, us greedy consumers. And we need to reduce our consumption, particularly of resource-intensive <coughs> foods. And that's where the whole livestock thing comes up. And there's more emphasis on the fat people than there is on the thin one. And there's more of a focus on being liberated from the trammels of consumption. It's a limits to growth agenda. It's, uh, you know, it's, been, it's been around since somebody invented religion, essentially. Um, and it's very much focused on absolute limits to growth. And then there's the, the concept of inequality, and this is perhaps more of the alternative system transformation movement, the international development movement, which says it's actually about the actors, the relationships among actors in the system. And we need to address the framing conditions. It's not just about production or just about consumption. We need justice, we need the freedom to self-determine, and we need equitable growth. And that these very reductive metrics are actually 
part of the problem. So, okay, so livestock. You will all be aware that the livestock issue is just very, very contested. We've got Everyone knows that its contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, that it uses all this land that drives deforestation, but also that it's the jobs and livelihoods for some very, very poor people, that it's good and it's bad nutritionally, um, that there are a whole set of ethical considerations, that it can use land unsuited to other purposes, it can recycle nutrients and so forth, and it's a huge source of cultural tradition, you know, and enjoyment. So probably most of you will be eating some form of meat on Christmas Day. Um, so there's a lot of advocacy, so, and you can see it all over the place. So, you know, we ought to eat red, less red meat. Actually, no, no, grass-fed beef's the solution. Um, but, but beef has so much more climate impact than chicken. At the same time, um, chicken uses all this grain that could be used for other, you know, to, to feed people directly. You know, the vegans say, when you eat meat, she doesn't eat. Whereas the CG movement, the International Lives of Research, as you say, livestock are really essential for nutrition and livelihoods of poor people. Of poor people. So kind of who's right? Well, in a way, everyone's right, but it gives rise to different visions of what, what role there is for livestock in a sustainable food future. So um, this, is, this is what you might call the, the kind of mainstream approach. It's kind of the future is white, the future is chicken. It's, you know, we can't do anything about demand. We need to produce this demand more efficiently. The best way of doing this is through intensive poultry production, which yields a whole range of different benefits, uh, relatively improvements in greenhouse gas efficiency, more meat, more, more meat for poor people, more of the foods we like. We can spare land for nature because we're squashing it all into very small space. Of course, there are risks. There's animal welfare issues. There's absolute versus relative improvements in efficiency. What's it going to do to the rural economy? What about zoonotic diseases? What about obesity? Well, we can, you know, low-fat chicken and all that. So there are risks. We can manage them. That, that's one way of looking at the solution. The other is to say, well, you know, the logical conclusion of that is actually to bypass sentience altogether and go for artificial meat. And there's lots of interest in it, in, you know, Bill Gates, etc. We can, we can produce what people want with much, much lower impact if we go down the artificial route. Of course, there will be concerns with naturalness and um, culture and tradition. You know, where are livestock on the uplands? Well, they're not there. But things always change. Everything changes. So there are risks they can be managed. Another approach is the kind of <coughs> Prince Charles approach, which is the fact that, you know, people like me, we can make use this, the whole grass-fed thing, that livestock can be part of the solution, uh, byproducts, land unsuited to other purposes, living in harmony, integrating with nature, etc., etc. And we essentially get something for nothing. It's the ultimate free lunch. And we can preserve our livelihoods and traditions. Of course, it does raise lots of questions as what do we mean by a genuine byproduct and genuinely land unsuited to other purposes? What about affordability? What about animal welfare? You know, are these animals going to get enough to eat? So there's all sorts of other questions it raises. And then the final one is the vegetarian approach, which is, you know, we, can't, we can do something about demand. Technology is not going to save us. If we cut back on meat, it's going to be win-win-wins all around. And, of course, that can spare land for nature. It's better for animal welfare, etc. But again, what are the substitute foods? What are we all going to be eating? Is it just maize? Are we going to have this wonderful biodiverse plant-based system? Um, people might not like this. What do we do about that? What do we do about landscape aesthetics? But livestock have always been on our landscapes. What do we do about the role of uh, livestock in our tradition, our culture, and so forth? So again, it raises question. And the point is here that we can model all these scenarios, and we can look at you know, which is better for landscapes and what would resource use look like and so forth, how much food, what kind of food you get out of them. But whether they work depends on all your assumptions about what the counterfactuals are, what, what else needs to be in place to make these work, the technological developments, infrastructure, the regulator and fiscal context, what other foods are going to be produced. <laughs> And also what your assumed counterfactual might be. So the kind of intensive poultry approach sounds like a solution if your alternative scenario is one where we all ate the same amount of meat, but it was all beef, because we'd have no forests left. On the other hand, people who don't like this scenario say, well, if we all ate lentils and cabbage and things like that, it, that would be much, much better than the chicken scenario. And so what would we eat if we didn't eat meat? Would we eat all these lentils and cabbages or we just eat loads of donuts? So your counterfactual shapes your view on what the solution and what the problems are. 
So my last two slides are, what are the implications of policy and action? Is this just you know, introspection about value sets? I think it's more than that, because I think numbers matter, and we need good research, and we need to look, we need to model these scenarios. But I think they only make sense if we understand the values that drive them, because we have so much advocacy, and we have no action. And I think that's because we're not exploring where, where we're coming from in all this debate, and we're not, we're not working hard enough to identify where there might be common ground and where we can maybe move forward. Because people can come from, reach the same conclusion for different reasons, or even start with the same value sets and, sets and reach different conclusions. I think we need to explore that. And then my final slide is it's not just about food, because I've worked on food for 20 years now. I'm getting a bit sick of it, partly because people talk about food and they fly off to go off and talk about food, or they forget about clothing, or they forget about their iPods and their iPads. We need to situate the healthy eating debate within a broader discourse about sustainable consumption. And we also need to situate the production and the agricultural debate within a broader debate about what we use our land for, what, it, what, what it's there, and what our place is in the natural world. And I'm going to conclude that.